you to watch the show. Um, for any of you who want to rock it old school, you can watch on TV, uh, television set that is, at Comcast Channel 22 or Prism TV Channel 8007. If you're more into the internet, uh, we stream the show on Livestream.com. You have to search for DPS TV. On Facebook, uh, search for EG Homework. Or YouTube, search for Denver DPS TV, all one word. So today we'll also have a special guest, Christine Leahy, the school program manager from the Butterfly Fly Pavilion. Um, she will also be bringing a special guest. I hope there are no arachnophobes in the studio. Yeah, our producer actually caught a live black widow last year and gave it to me so that I could show my class. So I think I'll be all set. Think you'll be okay? <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah, I think spiders are amazing creatures. I used to catch them all the time uh, and keep them in jars, but they never survived very long. I don't think I actually mm. figured out what to feed them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just thought they would eat whatever is in the jar, which Leaves, is nothing. Is just like the caterpillar. Yeah, which is nothing. Yeah. Like the caterpillar thing. Exactly. Spin a web. Come on, catch the nothing. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, anyway, so the homework hotline is sponsored by the Contemporary Learning Academy and Emily Griffith High School. Uh, Jeff, why don't you tell the audience a little bit about yourself and what you do here on the hotline? All right, I will. Uh, so there's definitely going to be a spider here later, huh? Definitely. Okay. A big well, one. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, anyway, uh, <laughs> my name is Jeff. I'm an intern here at DPS TV, and uh, I am taking all of your questions, math, science questions. I'm taking them right here on our social media board. Um, you can email us, get our questions to us, and then I will take them and matriculate them over to our experts over here, and they will be able to give you the answers. So again, let's uh, get us uh, come and uh, send us some questions, and we can get you, uh, we can get them answered for you. And I'm also known as the uh, trivia master. That's right. And I have a trivia question that I'm going to read at the beginning of the show, which is right now. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to read you this trivia question. If you know the answer, send in the answer, call in, whatever you need to do to get in the answer, and you can win a prize. That's right. Very exciting. So, drum roll. Let's go to the questions. How many paintings did Vincent van Gogh sell? How many paintings did Vincent van Gogh sell? That is the trivia question. We want to hear your answer. So uh, go ahead and uh, uh, get it to us right now, or whenever you get the answer. That sounds like a good one to take a guess on, too. Yeah. Like, why not? Come on, guys. Send, send in those guesses. Yeah, yeah, without giving out too many hints, I believe it's a number. <laughs> so just guess a number. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> All right, well, let's get you our full contact information. That way, if you do have a guess or even a real answer, you can get it to us. Um, so our full contact information... Um, you did get our phone number already on top of the screen, but you could send your homework questions to us or trivia answers to us at Facebook or Twitter at EG Homework. You could text them to us at 970-680-3771, or you could email us at homework at emilygriffith.edu. So those are all, that's, those are actually all Jeff's contact information uh, that's right. <laughs> for today, <laughs> but he's the one getting us the questions, so. All right, so Jeff. All right. What do we have waiting for us? Well, we've got a math question waiting for us. So um, it's going to go right here to the uh, board, if you will. And um, this, is, uh, this is kind of an interesting question here. Uh, I'll move that up a little bit so you can see it a little better. Uh, it says, I'm not really sure what you call this kind of shape, but I'm supposed to figure out its volume. And if you can kind of tell right here on our board, it looks like it's like a tent shape, like one of those uh, A-frame tent shapes. And uh, so it's like a triangular... Triangular something. Tube. Uh, yeah, tube's not the correct term. Did but you say prism? A prism? I would say a prism. A oh. huh. uh, I'm actually, and I like that you pointed out, it's a tent shape. This is a very old style tent. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, well, I've actually, that is how I camp. Yeah. <laughs> I tar I tar you I would. I yeah, why it. is this not surprising to me? I just, I that just is throw not surprising. The and sleep underneath yeah. it, and I do the A-frame can, all the time. Depends yeah, on the weather. It's like a World War II tent. A-frames are so easy that it's yeah, they are. to throw up. Yeah. Very simple. Kind of rugged. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. It's like the real camping. A little bit, a little bit more breezy than the yeah. other way. When you sleep with your feet outside too. Yeah. All right. So I just drew this figure really quickly on my sheet, and I'm gonna take some information there. But um, so this thingy is actually called a triangular prism. Now we'll talk about how you're gonna find the volume of this, but uh, I like to give a very generic formula. But really quickly. Um, what this means is a prism is kind of this shape that it's a three-dimensional solid, so it maintains the same shape all the way. So, you know, one that you're probably more like very familiar with is something like this. 
Um, this is also a prism. Um, this would be considered one thing to call this is a. Sorry, this always takes a little longer than I expect. Um, this is called a square prism, and you probably are used to referring to it as a cube. But what we're kind of thinking about when we have these prism shapes, and the way you know it's a prism, is that it maintains its shape all the way. So if you can kind of visualize, I kind of wish I had one of my objects that I have in my classroom here. But if you can kind of visualize what this shape is on down here, um, this is a square shape, assuming all these sides are of equal length. And one way to think about this is like a prism maintains the same shape of its base all the way through. So if you imagine uh, I were to stack this square over and over and over again on itself, uh, it would make this shape. Um, that's going to be true of, of this shape as well. Um, it's a prism shape. And the actual definition says that it has the same base on top and bottom. It's the exact same shape. So where you see I have a triangular shape on this base, I also have the exact same triangular shape on this base. So that's one of them, identical bases. Uh, the other rule for a prism is that its sides are flat. Um, so an example of what would not be a tri or a prism would be something that you're probably familiar with seeing like, let me clear this out something maybe like this shape, right? Something like this. So you might be used to seeing like a can, right? This is a very similar in a lot of the properties to a prism, but this is a cylinder. And again, it has two identical sides, assuming that my drawing was better. Uh, both the bases are the exact same shape. They're both circles, but the side is not flat. Um, so when we talk about prisms, they take a lot of shapes. So the prism aspect of it is that it maintains the shape throughout <coughs> or that it has identical bases and flat sides. But you could draw also a trapezoidal prism, uh, which would look something like, oh, that's really bad. Let me just, let me just sketch it so I don't look quite <laughs> as good. This takes too long. But a trapezoidal prism would look something like this, where I have a trapezoid shape, uh, and it's three-dimensional. And it would maintain that same shape throughout. So I like to, when I sketch these, I try to offset them a little bit. Um, but again, oh, this is a really bad drawing. Again, this is a three-dimensional shape where it's got a trapezoid on both sides, identical trapezoids, flat all the way, like on all the sides. So uh, when I set up this equation, I always teach my students to think of volume of any of these prisms as this formula. This is a very basic formula that will work for everything. And I think about this in terms of like, this is the area of the base, and this is the height of, you could say the object, you could say the solid, we typically say sol uh, object, um, but it's the height of the entire object. So actually, do you have those dimensions again really quick? That's something I forgot to write down. Do you have that, Jeff? Oh, sorry. Those dimensions, sorry. <laughs> I, I should have written that down, actually. Uh, OK, uh, let's see here. Let's go back to, uh, let's see. Um, so we had some dimensions here, and we yeah, said. Yeah, we did. So we got, um, OK, we got 24 centimeters high. 24 centimeters high. Uh, 19 centimeters wide. OK. And 47 centimeters long. Gotcha, OK. So. So um, I'm going to talk about those dimensions. Uh, like Jeff said, it looks like the dimensions are that it's 47 centimeters long. That's one, that's one perspective. Uh, when we do these, I want you to think about like, actually, let's take a second. Let's take a step back really quick. We want to find the area of the base. When we think about bases of a rectangular prism, if I were to look at this kind of tent shape, and like Sam may be familiar, he sets up his tent like this, he would think of the base as this rectangular shape down here. right? And you're thinking, you would probably think that because it's on the ground, right? It's like the base of your tent. Right. When we talk about prisms, when we talk about the bases, we're really talking about those like um, identifying shapes. Like in this case, there's that triangle that makes up both sides. I always think of those as my bases. And again, because those are the shapes that are maintained <clears throat> throughout the entire shape. So 
when we say, when we talk about the base, I'm going to think of this triangle right here as the base. And again, look, these three-dimensional objects, they have different orientations. So like, I can lay this calculator flat and think that this is my base. I could set it like this and think of this as my base, and it like this. Um, so the orientation is not really that important, which is why you can imagine like this triangular prism being set on the triangle. So I think of the kind of uh, identifying shape as the base of this figure. So in this case, the base is a triangular shape, and sometimes it helps to draw it separately. Um, we know that this triangle has a height of 24. So I'm going to say that this is 24 centimeters in here. And we know that it has a base of 19. That can be a little confusing because it's there are a lot of bases here. Um, but we want to say the area of the base, I don't know where those words went. Um, I'm going to come over here and say that in this case, my base is a triangle. So we need to think about like what the area of a triangle is. Um, the area of a triangle is half its base times height. Now the difference between the capital B and the lowercase b is the capital B represents the area of the base, whereas the lowercase b is specifically talking about that triangle. Um, so we could rewrite this formula and say volume equals the area of the base, which is now this one half base times height. And I could say one half base times height times the height of the solid. And again, if you imagine this figure here um, being laid on its triangle, then the height is going to be that 47 centimeters. So from here, we just have to plug a bunch of information in. And we can say that the volume equals 1 half the base of the triangle, which was 19, times the height of the triangle, which was 24, and then times the height of the entire solid or object. Um, and then from here, you could use a calculator or you could just go through this step by step. Um, but all we're doing is simplifying. Volume equals, I could do half of 12, which is 12, and then 12 times 19, let me just do this in a calculator so I don't make a mistake here, is 228, which is all of this, and then times 47. And we're going to get a volume of 10,716 centimeters cubed. So again, the reason why I like to use this very generic formula that volume equals the area of the base times the height is if I had some weird shape like this, like this trapezoidal prism, I can find the area of the trapezoid, which you'd need to know the formula for that, and then I can multiply that by the height of the prism. So that really works for everything. You just have to make adjustments <clears throat> inside of the formula. I like it. I like the way that you explain it. It helps um, figure out what other volumes are. You know, yeah. not just memorizing formulas. You're right. understanding why it is the way it is. Yeah, and I think if I, I used to teach it and say, like, okay, this is a volume of a trapezoidal prism, this is a volume of a triangular prism. But then the formulas like they look really complicated and they're a bit intimidating yeah. and there's so many of them. And there are exactly there are so yeah. many of them. I could never I could never memorize them. I mean Right, there's just a lot. But if I could figure it out, then right. we got it. All right. Let's go back to Jeff. All right. Let's uh, take another turn at the uh, board here. And uh, this is kind of a uh, this is an interesting question. This has to do with um, sight and eyes, uh, as in I see you. So uh, what is the transparent layer at the front of the eye called? Sam, what, what, is, what is that called? The yeah. transparent layer at the front of the eye called? Uh, that would be the cornea. Cornea. And I'll maybe just go over a little bit uh, the anatomy of the eye and sort of what each of the parts does, the, the major parts. So um, the cornea is, is effectively, we think of a lot of times as a protective layer. Uh, Below our eyelids, uh, uh, the cornea is just the sort of clear layer on the outside of the, the major functioning parts of the eye. Sometimes we don't think about the fact that, that also the cornea functions as uh, sort of the first lens of your eye too. Um, it's a clear window that allows light through to the, the most important parts of the eye. And damage to the cornea, uh, even, even just long-term natural damage, can result in loss of vision. Uh, laser corrective surgery 
uh, which a number of people uh, get these days, uh, typically works on the cornea itself, making it sort of reshaping it, making it smooth and uh, transparent again so that it can focus light uh, and allow a, a level of brightness and clarity into the eye. Uh, if we could jump to my screen really quickly, uh, I'll just sort of go through a couple other parts of the eye, the, the diagram for the eye. Um, just giving that just a minute to pop up on my screen. Can we just zoom in on your eye? You just do my eye. I can just <laughs> talk about my I'll eye. Point there it is. Yeah. That's the one. Uh, so, uh, okay, so you can see here the cornea label, the cornea being this sort of outer layer uh, below the eyelid. Uh, and then there's a few other parts that we've maybe talked about. So, um, the, the pupil and the iris, uh, the iris is sort of the beautiful uh, colored part of your eye, and the pupil is the dark center of it. The iris is a muscle that uh, opens back and forth, allowing more or less light through the pupil uh, to the lens. And then the lens is, is uh, really a, a much more precise uh, uh, lens than the cornea was, the cornea being that sort of first lens that light goes through. And the lens uh, very effectively channels light toward the fovea um, and, and the retina in general. So the retina is sort of this back part of your eye here. And, and the retina is the part of the eye where all of the light sensing cells, uh, what we talk about as rods and cones usually, uh, are, are going to be located. And the fovea is sort of the central point where most of them are grouped. So the, the lens really wants to aim light that you're seeing uh, toward the fovea. The fovea uh, having these, these light receiving cells um, then sends electrical signals to the optic nerve, and the optic nerve passes that information to your brain, and, and we uh, interpret those signals as images. So, anyways, that's the sort of basic rundown of the eye, but uh, the cornea, again, is that outer protective layer, also that initial lens. Um, and not a fun thing to get scratched, actually. <laughs> when I was a kid, yeah. I got sand in my, under my eyelid, and. Scratched my cornea and had to wear like a patch. An eye know? patch. Well, I wore like you know. So he looks cool. Well, I, not I really because it was too. a lame. It was like a lame uh, like band aid patch. Oh, it was like my a gauze dad, patch or something. My dad let me wear my Halloween pirate patch. Oh. Much at school, which made it okay. I was like, well, at least I'm a pirate. Now I'm cool. <laughs> yeah, I can deal with this. But it really was awful, and it feels like it feels like you have something in your, in your eye, eye, but you can't get it out. Yep. Oh. Uh, yeah. That would be really irritating. Although, did you have to do drops, or did it just kind of heal itself, drops. and you have to give it Yeah, time? so it was drops, and like yeah. every night it was drops. And I think I had it open when I could, but when I was at school, it was covered for a couple of days. Yeah. yeah. Just, uh... Heals pretty quickly, though. Yeah, it really yeah. does. It like, a lot quickly. of stuff inside, like when you cut the inside of your mouth, that also heals pretty mm -hmm. quickly. So yeah. it's sort of uh, inside and wet and covered in a mucusy layer, uh -huh. which our eyes and our mouth and our nose are, tend to heal more quickly. Mm -hmm. But also painful because of the... Yeah. 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 Definitely painful. And, like, your eyes so necessary yeah so and and what a lot of people do and what you have to be careful of is if you get something in your eye the temptation sometimes is to rub your and eye and you scratch your eye right so there's <laughs> different ways and i won't like go into what the ways are but rinsing your eye with water or whatever but look up safe ways to get stuff out of your eye but just not rubbing your eye because that's what you can scratch is your cornea do you have one of those at home do you have one of those like eye flushers i just, just have like case? the little it almost <laughs> looks like uh it's a little tiny glass um but it fits it's curved so that it fits over sort of the shape of your face. Oh, and you just and you, you just fill it up and you kind of like um, that and it washes your eye up. Yeah. It just works pretty well. Me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, not that I use it. Now that you're paranoid about scratching your eye. But I have it. I have it in my medical stuff. So. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> tangents. <laughs> yeah. Don't rub your eyes. That's what we do best as teachers, right? Talk yeah. Tangents. Like just randomly talk. I'm a professional <laughs> tangenter. Is a yes. tangent it, a uh, math term too? It is. It is. Mm -hmm. Going off on a tangent <laughs> that's related to math. Makes yeah. sense, makes hey, sense. But we always come back to where we need to come back anyways. Yeah. We're good at that. That's right. So speaking of where we need to come back to, Jeff. <laughs> well, let's come back to some math, shall we? Um, we got a, a, a complex problem up here that I don't know, I, maybe if you guys, you savants, math savants can solve. But um, this, is, uh, uh, this is quite, I don't know, for me it's complicated. It says, uh, parentheses, negative 10 times 4 plus 19 plus 7 times 2, parentheses, plus negative 5 times 4, minus 9 times 2, minus 10. Okay, I need the last part of that again. So you said okay. plus negative 5. Times 4. 
minus 9 times 2 minus 10. Okay. That's and it was a plus. Okay, let me read it to you one more time. Okay. So parentheses. Negative 10 times 4. Yes. Plus 19. Yes. Plus 7 times 2. Right. End parentheses. Yep. And then plus. Do I start parentheses again? Uh, yes. Oh, okay. I didn't do that. Okay, so plus negative 5 times 4. Oh, wait. Hang on. Lost it. Okay, negative 5 times 4 minus 9 times 2 minus 10. Yes. End parentheses. End parentheses, yep. I got you. This sounds like a PEMDAS problem. It's which, a PEMDAS oh, problem. I believe the acronym is uh, Pink Elephants Make Dandy Applesauce we talked about last yeah, week. Yeah, Pink <laughs> Elephants Make Dandy Applesauce. That is the truth. <laughs> so let's talk about that. those pink elephants that make dandy applesauce. I'll write that over here just to refresh our memory. Now, I'll go over this relatively quickly, but um, PEMDAS, um, you may have more commonly heard this as uh, Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, but we've decided here on the show that that's boring and we have better, <laughs> better um, mnemonic phrases. Is that what it's called? Mnemonic yeah. phrase for it? Yeah. So either way, the letters stand for the order that we're supposed to do our operations. P means that we are supposed to hit anything inside of parentheses first, which, well, in this case we do have, we've got a lot of parentheses here. From there, then we need to do any operations with exponents. Those are, for example, powers um, or also radicals, these square root signs. Those also fall under the exponent um, category. Uh, M and D stand for multiplication and division. And then addition and subtraction stand for addition and subtraction. Now, um, common thing, and I've, I've mentioned this before, is multiplication and division and addition and subtraction go at the same time, meaning <clears throat> the way that we know which to do first is from left to right. So if I have multiplication and division in a problem, I'm going to just do them from left to right. Doesn't necessarily mean multiplication always goes first. Um, same with addition and subtraction. So um, we're going to follow our order of operations, and I'll show you also how we might show our work that might make this a bit organized because we've got a lot going on. And the more you have going on, the more likely you are to make mistakes. Doesn't even matter how good you are at math. Just the more steps you have, the more chances you have to make mistakes. So we want to make sure we keep this organized. So we're going to start inside of our parentheses. And as I mentioned, it might be best to go left to right. So we have two sets of parentheses. I'm going to start in the one on the left. Now within that, I need to follow the rest of my order of operations. First, I check for exponents. No exponents here, no powers, we're good to go. Let's go on to the next step. Then we have multiplication or division. We do that from left to right. You might notice that we have two sets of multiplication. And so we would want to do these two sets of multiplication from left to right. So make sure the one on the left gets done first, everything gets rewritten, and then the one on the right gets done. So I'm going to leave my parentheses here. I'm going to start with this negative 10 times 4. It's going to give me negative 40. This plus 19, I didn't do anything with, so I'm going to leave it there. And then I have plus 7 times 2, which is 14, so plus 14. Then I'm going to rewrite everything else just to make sure that I am staying organized and I don't forget anything. All right. Then, so we hit our multiplication division. We got that in our first parentheses. Now we're going to do addition subtraction, and that's going to also go from left to right. So we'll start with this first set of addition here, and we'll do the negative 40 plus 19, which is going to give us negative 21 plus 14. And then again, just rewrite everything else. Now it might seem annoying to rewrite everything else, but honestly, it's worth it because it keeps you organized and it keeps you from making mistakes. Um, really, really does. Then we can finally finish this in this parentheses. We have the negative 21 plus the 14, and that's going to give us negative 7. And because we've done everything inside of our parentheses and there's nothing, new no operations being applied to that, um, we can drop our parentheses at this point. And Again, I'm going to rewrite everything else. It may seem redundant, but it's worth it. 
And then we'll do the same process in our other set of parentheses. So we're going to hit our multiplication from left to right first. <clears throat> so I'll start with this negative 5 times 4. I'm going to rewrite my 7 and then do my negative 5 times 4, which is negative 20. Minus 9 times 2, negative 10. I still, you may notice, have another multiplication problem in here. So I'm going to think of this, this minus sign as a negative. And so I have negative 9 times 2. So I've got 7 again, rewriting. Negative 20, rewriting. And then negative 9 times 2 is going to give me negative 18. So I'm going to call that a minus 18. So if I add negative 18, it's the same thing as subtracting it. I'm going to say minus 10. So we're done with our multiplication and, um, and division. Now we've got to hit our addition subtraction. And this is a long one, so we're going to have to scroll down here. So we'll do subtraction from left to right. I've got this negative 20 minus negative 18. Still rewriting my negative 7. And we get negative 38 minus 10. And then just finishing out what's in the parentheses here. I've got, lost my pen, I've got my 7, negative 7, I'm rewriting, and then negative 38 minus 10, so that's going to give me negative 48. And then now, as you can kind of see, it's started very, very lengthy, and we're simplifying it, meaning we're taking it down smaller, smaller, smaller. We only have one last operation to do, and that means that it is the addition, and it's going to be negative 50. 55, oh my gosh, hang on. Sorry, trying to do two things at once. Negative 55. So, that big, large expression, mathematical expression we started with, we just used our PEMDAS, our order of operations. We used that to help us kind of cut it down and simplify it into just one little number, negative 55. Ta-da. Yeah, that is uh, quite a process, but again, <laughs> yes step by step and continuing to follow that PEMDAS kind of algorithm. Mm -hmm. um, so it looks like we're going to go to a break. When we come back, we have Kristen Leahy from the Butterfly Pavilion, uh, and she's got a spider. Oh, uh, so that's pretty exciting. Oh, boy. Jeff, you seem pretty pumped uh, yeah, about I'm, that. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited a little bit, <laughs> a little nervous. So we get, we're going to go to commercial, and when we come back, we're going to get to see Jeff be a little squeamish, hopefully. <laughs> There's times when you wander and ponder all the labels you've received. Believe me, I've got a few. Never mind from when, why, or how. Because now, everything's different. i found the perfect place. A space where the labels fade and I'm accepted and supported. Check what the news reported. Emily Griffith helps all who wish to learn. Turn towards your future while you finish the basics on your time. Prime opportunity in this mature environment? The only requirement is motivation and thirst for success. Invest in your passions. There's no limit to how far you'll go. And know that you'll have something in common with everyone here. We all chose empowerment over standing still in fear. We'll start loosening up those muscles for that rub. I can't believe how much Emily Griffith Technical College has helped me personally and my career so much. They really invested a lot into me. I really felt it while I was there as a student. And I think because of that love and support, I was able to have more confidence in myself. I've been able to open a business for myself. I can do anything I want, right? And I'm not talking about my schedule. I'm talking about that I can truly give back to the community. Hi, welcome back. We're here with Christine Leahy from the Butterfly, Butterfly Pavilion. Um, she's the school programs manager there. That's right. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Welcome to you, 
Oh my and gosh. Rosie. <laughs> Rosie. Rosie says welcome is what yeah. I should so say. So this is Rosie, Rosie the tarantula. Could you tell us about Rosie? Because of course, yes. yeah. That's yeah, she's kind of the star of the show. Yeah, she yeah. really is. She's wonderful. So Rosie is our ambassador invertebrate. Okay. We are an invertebrate zoo, and Rosie is a Chilean rose hair tarantula. Okay. And when I say ambassador, she's our flagship ambassador. We have over 5,000 animals at Butterfly Pavilion, and she is the one that is uh, often thought of as the experience, you know, the piece that you remember because you get to hold Rosie if you choose to when you come oh. to Butterfly Pavilion. Oh my God. So she's handled quite a bit then. Do I get to hold her? Can yes, I, hold her? I can help you with that if you'd oh. like. Yes. You just hand me, you give oh me one God. hand, you're not gonna cup your hand. <laughs> okay. We're gonna give her a safe place to walk, so ha give me one hand, just one. Oh my God. You've got two <laughs> out there, I just need one. Okay, all right. I could count. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hold your hand, you're gonna put your thumb flat, nice and flat, like a pancake is what okay. we tell the kids. And then I hold you while she walks on you and that way she knows she's safe oh my gosh mm -hmm. yeah <gasps> she's holding rosie come over here now what surprises you about this yeah definitely, definitely uh she's pretty light she's very light there's not much to them they wow. don't have a a oh heart and lungs the same way we they do have a circulatory system they do have a respiratory system but it's not the heavy kind of organs we have in our body she moves her legs uh it's a pneumatic kind of system, air pushing through her, or actually, excuse me, hydraulic. It's water or fluid going mm -hmm. through her body that helps her move her legs. Oh my so, gosh. Yeah, and there she goes. <gasps> Can I do this? Uh, I'm going to go on this you side. You do that. <laughs> and then I'll have her if you'd like to do that again. I do. Christine, when I, I used to live in New Mexico, mm -hmm. and there were lots of tarantulas that used to come out on the really? roads after a rainstorm. Oh yeah. How is Rosie different from the tarantulas we might run into here in the West? Well, she's from Chile, which is in South America, mm -hmm. but she's very closely related to the ones that we have in North America. Um, the ones that are in Colorado and in Northern New Mexico are a different color. They're a different species, and the, the male and the female are different colors, mm -hmm. um, but they have some similarities in that the females, the males have to migrate to find the females for mating. The same thing with the tarantula, this tarantula, and then get her to walk this way. And they spend most of their life in a burrow. Tarantulas mm -hmm. are not uh, <clears throat> jumping hunters. They're not spin a web and catch their food in a, a web. So the ones in New Mexico that you were speaking of would have those things in common with Rosie. Oh, cool. She's so pretty. Yeah, she really is. A lot of times people are confused about um, the different parts. If you can see back here, do you see this right oh. there? Yeah. Yeah, what we have there are the spinnerets. That's what I thought. Okay. So that tells us that this is a female, which the ones that we have people uh, hold are the females. They're a little more docile. Okay. And um, the other thing that people ask us a lot about are the eyes. Can you see the little cluster yeah. of, of on the like top there, yeah. Balls. They're really uh -huh. small, though. Oh, yeah, they, they are, really and it's a cluster of eight eyes, so... That's what I thought. Yeah. Okay, yep. this is really mm -hmm. small eight eyes, mm -hmm. considering how big she is. Yep. A little while ago, she wasn't walking very much at all because she had traveled in the car in a cooler, and they have to... They are cold-blooded animals, mm -hmm. or poikiotherms, oh, yeah. so they have to get their... Their body temperature is that of the air temperature around them. Mm -hmm. and of course, they can't live in the kind of temperatures that we have outside today. Mm -hmm. So we have to be very careful to carry them in a cooler and keep warm the car up for her and all of that. So, oh, yeah. Man. Did you want? Did you want to yes. hold her name? That's why I'm really <laughs> He's to. standing right there. I'm trying to be polite, but I'm like, yeah. I want to hold her. Yeah. <clears throat> we have a, a fun <laughs> uh, actual class. If you want to come around here, I need to be oh, right yeah, next okay. to you. Um, we have a fun class called it the Virtual Invertebrate Encounter. So this is an invertebrate encounter. You're getting to be close Indeed up and friendly with an invertebrate. Oh, is this right. what you she do at the light. museum? I mean, do you, uh, what is it that you do at the museum? Is this what you do or, or, or what else do you do? Me personally? Uh-huh. Well, I manage the programs for the schools. And so that's the, let me go ahead and take her one, okay. one hand at a time. Um, and so we do field trip classes, get her to stop. We do field trip classes at Butterfly Pavilion. Okay. Um, we don't have the children hold them during classes at Butterfly Pavilion because they have a chance to do that in our exhibit. Mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. area. If we come out to an outreach program where we come into classrooms, some of our classes mm -hmm. actually do um, have a ro what we call a rosy hold, and others mm -hmm. don't. If we're teaching about aquatic invertebrates, we're not bringing rosy, but mm -hmm. we might bring instead, here, let me, oh. let me bring, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, we might bring instead cool. a, what we call a reef in a jar. So invertebrates that would live uh, in a reef environment in the ocean, we would bring them instead, and then the children would get a chance to see them up close. Not everything's touchable. We're not going to have you hold a scorpion. Um, Probably a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, good thing. <laughs> we're not going to have you, uh, we're not going to take a sea star out to a school because mm -hmm. that would be very, very hard to maintain the environmental conditions mm -hmm. that they need. Um, but we do set up stations in classrooms dri driven with guiding questions. Um, and an investigation where they need to observe that animal or model or it, sometimes there's media in with it and through a, the lens of the question and to begin to understand invertebrates. So all of our classes are inquiry-based, driven by, are you familiar with the 5E model of science instruction? Yes. So we mm -hmm. use that. I don't know if you can feel this or not. Oops, I just knocked that over. But she's spinning a little bit. Oh, so, really? Yeah, so what that means is, is she's giving us a little bit of silk. You can't see it very well, but I can feel it on my hands. Mm. Oh, wow. Yeah. What is the functionality of the fact that they have like, a lot of hair? Oh, my gosh. oh, that's a great question. Can I have you try something? Yeah. Okay, so take like your little finger or your ring finger, uh -huh. and I'm going to demonstrate here. You're doing great. You're doing great with this. And just gently <laughs> touch your eyelashes, not your eyelid, but your eyelashes. Uh -huh. Okay. Can you feel it? Yeah, it's very sensitive. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. And your eyelashes are not alive, right? Right. Yet you're feeling it. Mm -hmm. Why are you feeling your finger touching the hair of your eyelash? The vibration in your mm -hmm. eyelid. And those eyelashes are attached to your skin, mm -hmm. the skin of your right. eyelid. So imagine, she doesn't have skin like us. She has an exoskeleton. But imagine if you were covered everywhere on your body yeah. with these kinds of with eyelashes exactly you could feel every change in the temperature of the oh, air wow. you could feel every change in the direction of the air flow you could um, sense your environment hypersense it mm -hmm. yeah so that's it helps her to know what's going on in her world wow that's it cool. and that's the thing that some people tell us that's what they're uncomfortable with the hair the hair so hairy right <laughs> it's so hairy yeah. And yet, for her, it's merely a survival mechanism to be hairy like that. Yeah. I think it would be more scary if it was less hairy, honestly. I would think it so, be? too. Yeah. It's almost, she's almost furry. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like a yeah. Little, I don't know. Now, cat. some people will ask us, can I pet it? Oh. Oops, sorry. I didn't mean to startle no, you. okay. She'll say, can I pet her? Oops. There we go. Just nudge her a little bit. Hang out. And yeah, she, you're nice and warm, so she feels comfortable. And we say so pider, cool. spiders aren't like mammals, mm -hmm. uh, like a cat or a dog it, that you might have at home, might really enjoy being touched that way. But remember, her hairs are a survival mechanism to sense right. her world, to know when there's danger. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't feel comfor comfortable mm. for like her. Like if I were to rub my eyelashes, it doesn't feel good. Right. No, it doesn't. That's yeah. a really good way, to, yeah, right. that's a good way to think of it. Yeah. yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. So we do, um, you asked what it is that I do there. We do all kinds of classes from aquatic invertebrates, butterfly life cycles, adaptations of invertebrates, okay. um, ecosystems, helping people understand how an invertebrate, just doing what it does to get its habitat needs met, is making a difference for other mm. organisms, including mm. people. So like pollination, for example, mm -hmm. you know? That's so can you tell us a little bit since uh, you're you have a lot of butterflies there. Like, what are some mm -hmm. programs that, uh, that you guys are having coming up in January? In January, we will, January is a little bit of a quieter time, but mm -hmm. early in Jan January, we are having Living Lights. We're actually starting that the 21st of December, and Living Lights is a holiday lighting festival in vertebrate style. So people, lots of people have come to Butterfly Pavilion during the day and see the butterflies flying. But in the evening, most butterflies roost or sleep, and they hang in the trees. And we'll have some moths that are active at that time, so you can see. We'll have all kinds of invertebrates that will feature that glow in the dark. Oh, wow. That, um, wow. That, yeah, very for festive, us, yeah, <laughs> it's very festive. We'll have 
are, are uh, ocean creatures that are biofluorescent. Uh -huh. So we'll have those as well, cool. or bioluminescent. Cool. We'll have those as well. So some animals can absorb and emit, can absorb light and uh -huh. then glow, and others can actually create their own light. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so cool. Mm -hmm. yeah. So more than just butterflies. Way more than butterflies, <laughs> yeah. yeah. If you have 5,000 animals, you're so going to have lots So how many butterflies more. do you have? Yeah. Do you There's know? about, if you go into our Wings of the Tropic exhibit, about 1,000 to 1,500 on oh, any given the, day. Do you see the, yeah, some, of the, see some of the, some of the, the silk? Yeah. It's really hard to see, but. And you said they're not web spinners, so what's the function of those? Well, she doesn't spin a web to catch her food. In mm -hmm. other words, those, those spiders that are going to hunt by having something, you know, get caught in there and then they wrap them up in the, in the silk. Mm -hmm. That's not the kind of spider she is. Right. She is a tunnel dweller or a burrow dweller, and so she hides the entrance to her burrow with her gotcha. silk. Of course, it can also alert her that something's coming near her burrow, but by and large, it's to hide it. Mm. And she's right now trying to hide me. <laughs> So Can you tell us a little bit about opportunities you have for like teachers if they want to bring students or kind of? Uh, mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah, field trip classes. Um, we have four time slots per day, September through May, 9.30, 10.30, 11.30, and 12.30 for 45 minute classes. Surprisingly, we can actually work with 50 students at a time in each of our wow. two classrooms. Wow. And each class, um, if you do a life cycles class, you're going to have live animals and you're going to learn about what these animals look like at different stages of their life cycle. Hmm. If you have an adaptations class, you may be looking at four or five different invertebrates and figuring out what some of their adaptations are. So my point is, is that each of those classes are very interactive. Uh -huh. Kids work in small groups. They are going to see up close and sometimes handle invertebrates. Um, and they are going to figure out the answer to some mysteries or at least to some questions. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. So. Since you mentioned like that they can see see them at different stages of their life, I, I heard you have like a live chrysalis cam for the we, butterflies. We do what? in our wings. Yeah, in our wings of the tropics exhibit, mm -hmm. we have um, chrysalids that have are in different stages of um, that metamorphosis. They're all in the mm -hmm. chrysalis stage, but they will emerge at different times. And so the camera, if you're not there, you can see when they emerge via that camera. If you're there, you could watch them emerge. If you stand there for 10, 20 minutes, you're going to see wow. something come out yeah. of the chrysalis and emerge as a butterfly or a moth. Oh, that's that's, cool. that's really cool. When I was a kid, I always wanted to see that. And, uh, and you know, we didn't have live cameras. So um, I just had to try it on my own. Didn't really work out. You but just there you go. There <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah did. Well, we, did, we get school groups that will have caterpillars that they'll have raised in their classroom. Uh -huh. And that when they emerge as butterflies, they come to Butterfly Pavilion for their field trip, and then we release them into the wings of the tropics. That's very yeah. cool. We That's also have cool. another uh, live stream cam that is for a coral reef. And that one is really, that's new. We've only had that for a few months. And it's really exciting for people to be able to connect to the ocean environment, which has many invertebrates in it, and uh, see what's going on in a coral reef. Yeah. yeah. And so you guys are, are uh, growing actual coral in this reef, living coral? We. Well, that particular one is a live stream from an actual reef off oh. the East Coast. Oh, okay, wow. Um, but we do have coral tanks where there's live coral, and we have uh, ta in those tanks we are also demonstrating reef conservation methods, mm -hmm. including having reef trees or coral trees. And on those, it's a PVC pipe in, you know, in T formations, and hanging from them with fishing line are live coral, and then we're propagating or um, breeding, if you will, the polyps, the small individual animals that mm -hmm. make up a coral reef, um, so that we can demonstrate, whoops, sorry, sweetie, uh, so that we can demonstrate for people things people can do, human activities that can help reefs, because there's some of our activities that have damaged reefs, but there's a lot we can do to restore them or huh. mitigate those damages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm. so that's really cool too. So it sounds like you can learn a lot. You can, you can touch a it. A whole you lot. Can, touch a sea star, you can find out how an invertebrate that lived at the time of dinosaurs is medically significant and we use the blood from, are you familiar with horseshoe crabs? 
Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 They're uh -huh. not. They're not crabs actually. Right. They're closely, they're not. more closely related to, to Rosie. Yeah. They look kind um, of alien. They, they do. They look they kind of alien. They do. Front. They're really cool. And then the I, actually, I actually have a horseshoe crab exoskeleton that I just had. That you got, yeah. Uh, somewhere in my stuff, but we found it on a beach in Cape Cod they're cool. years ago. They are they're very all cool. Around, yeah. Well, those animals yeah. have been around since well before dinosaurs, mm -hmm. yeah. and a component of their blood is used in, um, in various drugs for humans. And without that component, those drugs wouldn't last as long or be as effective. Wow. So who, you know, yeah. who knew that an invertebrate that we wouldn't interact with regularly in our lives here in Colorado could be so important mm -hmm. to our lives medically? Mm -hmm. Who knew? Mm -hmm. yeah. Who knew? Well, we got to wrap it up, but um, I wish you could stay on longer because that was so really, really cool. Christine, yeah. thank you Bye so Rosie. much for, for coming on our show. Bye, Rosie. Thank you yeah. for coming on our show. And if you are interested, um, the website was on the bottom of the screen while, um, while, uh, while we were talking. And just check that out at the Butterfly Pavilion. Mm -hmm. All right, thank thanks, you. Christy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. We'll be back in just a minute. Fala Samin's enrollment in the cosmetology program follows the path of a few family members. My grandpa and my mother both were cosmetologists and I've been around it so I always had a passion for it. Her passion generates an excitable experience. I like everything. I am nervous about everything of course starting off but I feel like I can do it. We'll watch her advance and see her inspiration with clients and you get to be creative and do what you want. She's glad she's here. I'm like, Griffith is a great place to go to. Welcome back. I thought that was so cool. Did you guys think that was cool? That was awesome. That was so cool. Really cool. Well, um, back, to, back to work, back to the grind. But before that, we need to get our trivia question um, one more time, just to give you guys a chance to answer that. So Jeff, tell us our, your trivia question one All more right. time. The quick trivia question one more time is, how many paintings did Vincent van Gogh sell? How many paintings did Vincent van Gogh sell? That is the trivia question. So make your guesses, get it into us, and uh, we'd, uh, we'd love to hear from you. So. Yeah, if you have an answer, call that number on the top of that screen there. Like soon. Really soon. <laughs> All right. All right. Let's get more of your questions answered. So, Jeff, what do we have waiting for us? All right. Well, we got an interesting question here. Um, now, this is, uh, this is kind of weird because, um, you know, we were talking about uh, 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 the, the cold-blooded animals and the uh, exoskeletons and all that stuff. But this is, um, this is kind of a, a, a different kind of animal. Um, which of the following felines cannot roar? And uh, we have a list here. A lion, a puma, a jaguar, or a leopard? Which one of the following felines cannot roar? So uh, the only big cats that can roar are, uh, there are four of them, and they're all in the genus Panthera. Um, so a lion can roar, a jaguar can roar, a leopard can roar, and a panther can roar, but a puma cannot. And the reason for that is just that uh, these four uh, large cats have, there's a, a bone in most vocal cord systems, uh, and that bone in these large animals is replaced with a ligament that allows uh, these larger cats to actually stretch their vocal cords open further. They can lower the wavelength, or sorry, uh, lower the frequency, increase the wavelength of the sound that they emit, um, and create these really deep, rumbling roar sounds. So there are actually five cats in the genus Panthera. One of them is a snow leopard. Snow leopards uh, 
Also, they have that ligament, but they can't roar because they lack some other pieces necessary for, for that sound. So it really is just those four large cats that are capable of creating that sound. Hmm. That's all I got, though, about hmm. big cats. Yeah, but now we know why they roar. That's true. It's not just that they can roar. Right. What's, so. what's the difference between a puma and a panther? Do you know? Well, so, so I mean, they're, they're, they're different cats. There's several differences. They're, uh, uh, God, I guess, so a, a puma's going to be smaller. Um, oh, jeez. I'll try to think of some other differences, but they, they're not even from the same genus. Okay. Um, and they're located in totally different parts of the world. Ah, okay. All right. Well, uh, we have a uh, math question, and this is kind of a quick one here. Uh, this, uh, this, is a, this has a, a picture of a, of a scale right here. And it says, the picture below shows that one box is heavier than five identical cans. The box has a mass of 40 kilograms. Which, what could be the mass in kilograms of the can? And we have a, uh, a couple of uh, answers down here. Um, but what, what, could, uh, what could the mass in kilograms be okay. of, the, uh, of the can? Of one can, I'm sorry, of one can. OK, and then what are the choices? OK, the choices are? 40, 10, 8, or 6? 8 or 6. Yeah. Or 6. OK. I will do my best to answer this pretty quickly. Um, so what we know is that um, 40 kilograms is heavier than, this, than this, um, these cans. OK? Pardon my terrible drawing. Please. That's it's pretty really good. I'm just trying to be like really, <laughs> really quick here. Um, but these little circles here, these are my cans. Those are cans. Kind of like an alien face. Yeah. And, um, yeah. <laughs> and so what it's we crazy. know also, if, if let's say that these two were equal to each other, then each of these cans, um, we could take this 40 divided by 5 to find out what each can would weigh. And that's just, again, if they were equal. So we'd say 40 divided by 5, that's 8. So if, um, if again, um, these two weights were equal, they'd be eight kilograms each. But we know that um, this 40 kilograms is heavier. So the cans are actually lighter than eight kilograms each because if they were eight, they'd be equal. So that means they have to be something, these cans have to be less than eight kilograms in order to make this scale have the heavy, the 40 kilograms be more heavy than the um, cans. So that would eliminate A, B, C, and leave us with D. So we could say that each can could be six kilograms. We could also check this um, by doing six times five to see that this total weight here would be 30 kilograms. If I, um, my six kil kilograms times the five cans would give me 30 kilograms. Yep, that's lighter than 40 kilograms. It checks out. So that was kind of a quick answer. I hope I didn't forget anything. Uh, can I just show, this will be really quick, not to add too much. I think we've got like five or six minutes left. But, okay. um, but another way, and I think we talked about this before, is to set up an inequality. Oh, yeah. And think like X is the weight of a can. And, and we can say that five times the number of cans has to be less than 40. So if each can weighs the same, we can set one variable. And we can just solve this like the same way we would solve any regular equation. And we can say x has to be less than 8 mm -hmm. uh, in those kilograms. And then, and then we could test that really quick. But again, like we could set up uh, an inequality for that yeah, and solve and it, that way. Actually, that's, that's really kind of um, that's nice to say. I think that's where a lot of this is going, where these scale right. problems, yeah. you're, they're trying to start to get you to start thinking in equations and like, okay, these unknown right. things, these cans, these unknowns, this is the same thing as variables. So they can absolutely lead to equations and inequalities. Um, and, and most situations can be solved with inequalities or right. equations as well, whether we have to or not, but they can be. It's a good, good skill to know. So nice to see both ways. All right, so I think it's, I think it's trivia question time. Ooh, is that correct? Am yes, I right, Jeff? Yes, I believe it is. Yes. It's that time. So we're going to reveal the answer to the trivia question. So mm -hmm. everybody get ready. Let's repeat the question one more time. How many paintings did Vincent van Gogh sell? I have no idea. And here comes the answer. The answer is... 
one. That's right. And That's it, was, it. Yes. I knew one it was going to be like a one super sad answer. Yeah. The red like vineyard at Arliss is the uh, is the ant is the painting, and we have a little picture of the painting up there. Um, yeah, it was interesting because um, he and that and just that was just the single thing in his entire lifetime. Um, it was an oil landscape titled the Red Vineyard at Arliss, and it was purchased in 1890 by Van Gogh's friend and feller painter Anna Bosch. Uh, sold for 400 francs in Paris. It now resides in Moscow's um, Honshkin Museum of Fine Art. So it's, uh, and, and these, and as you guys know, Van Gogh today, his paintings are just, you know, they're worth, worth, worth yeah. millions of dollars. It costs a lot more than yeah. 400 francs. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah it's super ironic that, yeah. and really tragic that he yeah. lived. He's one of those artists that I think we think of as, you know, that died impoverished and just not in right. a good place. And today, the art is celebrated in all over the place. Right. You know, you like a handbag with knew. Starry Night on it. Yeah. But. Interestingly, uh, so in 1889, he was invited to participate in a group show, and he brought six of his paintings, and that's mm -hmm. when this was sold. Um, it was sold to Anna Bach, or Bach, not really sure. Um, she's a Belgian artist and art collector. Uh, she bought that painting in early 1890, and they say it's perhaps she liked the painting, or maybe she just wanted to show her support. Uh, but because he was being criticized a lot of the time, mm -hmm. um, but they're saying like perhaps it was to help him financially or just to please her brother Eugene, who she knew was a friend of Vincent. So it's kind of interesting that the one painting that was sold was maybe just like a favor because she a felt favor. a little bit bad for her. Aw, I'll support It was going to be zero, <laughs> but let me just buy one painting. <laughs> yeah, he needs a little keep, cash. So keep painting your little pictures. This so yeah, well, that's actually, cute. she owned she owned two. Um, paintings of Van Gogh's. Oh, what was the other gift? Um, How did that And <clears throat> what was the other one? The other one, I don't know what the other one was. That'd be a gift to be stolen, right? Um, but, her, <laughs> didn't sell it. but her brother, her brother Eugene, actually owned several of them. Oh. Um, and let's see. So she sold. She sold. She did make a profit on this one too. So she sold it for ten thousand francs, and then it was sold again um, to. Uh, Russian textile businessman um, as well, and then eventually given to the Pushkin Museum by the state of Russia. Hmm. So that's where it is now. His style is just, it's iconic now. I got a chance to see some of it. They, they had uh, the yeah. uh, exhibit over here at the Art Did they have the Van Gogh exhibit yeah. here at the Denver Art Museum? I actually had a chance to see it in Chicago. I went to oh, the wow. Chicago Art Museum. It was so amazing. It was uh, so cool. Really, really incredible to see. It's amazing yeah. that people didn't appreciate what that was at the time. Mm -hmm. it just lets you know how different it was back then. It was definitely the era, though. I mean, um, I'm going off of memory. You know, when the camera was invented, then art and painting as we know it changed. Mm -hmm. And it used to be where the better painter you are, the more real life like you can, you can paint. But then after the camera was invented, there was no need to. Right. duplicate exactly mm -hmm. what you see so then we started getting more artistic with it and um, was not really appreciated at, at first people would be like that's not art mm -hmm. you know, and <laughs> yeah but, all right so we're going to have to say goodbye um, and this is a long goodbye this time we'll be back we're taking break it's our early season finale <laughs> yeah this is like our oh, yeah, mid yeah finale we're going on hiatus so we're like South Park, uh, we take a break in the middle and then come yeah. back to the other episodes. <laughs> Until January. So we're going to have to uh, say goodbye to you and just enjoy your break. Be safe. Be safe. Save all those homework questions for us and we'll be back again in January. We'll see you then. Bye, guys. Thanks.